All right, recording is in progress. So we'll have a few come in uh, now that it's after the hour. So uh, we'll give you guys the full hour. So we're happy this morning to have Steve and Bobby this with us this morning from Air Asset Management to talk about investing in life settlements. Uh, some of you might be familiar with that asset class and others might not, but we uh, we wanted to get Bobby and Steve in here today to talk about that. So uh, Bobby, Steve, I know you're going to be handing the presentation back and forth. Uh, Bobby, I believe you're kicking us off. So uh, while while the presentation is going on, feel free to throw questions in the Q&A. Uh, it's going to be easier than the chat. So if you have questions during the presentation or when we open it up, if you throw it in the Q&A, we'll get to it. And uh, with that, Bobby, I will kick it over to you to get us started. Beautiful, Ryan. Thank you. And welcome. Good afternoon or good morning, depending upon where you are sitting uh, today. Thank you for taking the time and thank you left field for allowing us to present the uh, life settlements uh, space to you. Um, you know, obviously this is a, a very fast and growing sector uh, and niche uh, market. So we, we look forward to, to really kind of uh, doing a good high level. The goal is to bring it from 30,000 feet down to 1000 feet for you today. Um, you know, my background, my, my name is Bobby Whalen. I also have uh, Steve Longo. I'm the senior advisor to air asset management. Steve is actually the chief investment officer, and we really like to, when we do these webinars, we really like to try to keep it more conversational. Um, although we have a slide deck and a presentation that we'll go through today that'll be helpful, um, we kind of like to keep it kind of, you know, flowing uh, as we kind of go through this. So maybe just a little bit of background uh, for myself, and I'll have Steve introduce himself. Um, my background is I've been in the financial services space since 1990. I um, started as a financial advisor, got my Series 7 in uh, August of 1990. Um, and was working with IDS American Express. Um, had a, built up a successful practice, um, moved myself up to a field vice president and then a group vice president. So ultimately I led the central US for um, Ameri American Express, which eventually became Ameriprise. So I had over 3000 financial advisors, um, over 18 years in the business. Um, so strong background and, and knowledge base um, in the financial services space. Um, Steve, maybe kind of hand it over to you for a second. To give him a little bit of your sure. sure, thanks, Bob. So um, I've been in this market 40 years, since 1983. Uh, my background has been pretty eclectic within finance, but essentially being a banker, uh, investment banker, and then portfolio manager. Uh, I really began with a small bank in, in New York City, um, lending and doing deals and working as an analyst for uh, the the lower middle market back in the mid 80s, uh, then joined Paraba and uh, eventually worked for a subsidiary bank of theirs and ran uh, capital markets for North America. Then I went out into uh, the straight buy side, joining on hold and a splice rotor uh, in the mid 90s, uh, essentially managing a uh, derivative book for uh, their buy side activity. And I went out on my own for a number of years and then joined a firm out of Chicago uh, where I ran the asset management division, uh, focused really on managed futures and uh, joined Air in 2014, having a relationship with Air's founder, uh, uh, Richard Balutz, while I was at my prior uh, firm. And uh, we've essentially built this business and uh, built the... Uh, the asset management uh, function that we have right now since 2014 in the longevity space. And uh, right now I, I, I'm a principal of the firm as well as a chief investment officer. Yeah, a few, a few points I think it's important to, to know about AIR um, and, and maybe to set some framework for this space of life settlements. Um, it's something that our founder, Rich, Rich Balutz back in 2008 was actually entered the space. Um, as Steve mentioned, founded the firm in late 2013, and our first flagship fund um, was launched in 2017. Um, and it's very important to know that because there's obviously been a lot of growth in this business. It's a, it's a niche space, um, and it's been something that's really changed a lot since 2008. Uh, and we'll kind of get into that today. But it's very important to, if, you, if you're considering this asset class, is to work with a group that has been through the goods, bads, and uh, challenging times and the good times of, of the space. Um, it's not just having the experience of how to enter the space, how to acquire um, policies, um, how to manage policies, but it's also having the relationships to be able to source policies 
Um, and, you know, just the experience of, of how to set the funds up and to, to do it the right way. Um, so, you know, one great thing about AIR, our flagship fund we'll get into, but uh, it's been around for over five years. We haven't had a down month. Uh, we're up over 13 and a half percent last year. Um, and we'll kind of get into some of the details there. But, you know, Steve has just done an incredible job with his background and his experience, along with our CEO, Rich, kind of in this space and the network that they've actually built up. Um, we actually host um, a very large conference, kind of preeminent conference in, in the industry where we bring some of the top minds, um, some of the top players into the space. We do continuing education for RAs. Um, we launched that last year. And what we've really tried to do is institutionalize and bring um, a, a, bring a level of, of, of institutional expertise to a, a kind of a niche space. So we're excited to be able to talk to you today about you know, a, a lot of things. Obviously, our goal is to, as I mentioned before, to start at 30,000 feet. So, so to really give you the, the history uh, and the background of life settlements, kind of how it was formed, um, how it's developed over the years and the evolution of the industry and kind of how it went from um, you know, the infancy through, you know, the tertiary markets into institutionalization in the space. And also, you know, talking into, you know, we want to talk today about obviously the investments um, and, and look, considering investing into this, what are some of the risks? Um, and, you know, and obviously we'll open this up for Q&A and be more than happy to address some questions and concerns. But once again, our goal is to try to bring you from 30,000 feet down to that 1,000 foot mark today. So fundamentals on the industry. You know, my, Steve, let me kind of hand this over to you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about kind of what are life settlements and how they work? Sure. So, Steve Froze, he's still there. I'm going to. Well, I think Steve's screen has froze uh, for the time for the time being. Um, I can actually kind of jump in, and then Steve can kind of hop on as we go. Um, but you know, life settlements uh, in, in kind of what are life settlements? You know, it's a primary market for insurance when the coverage is initially purchased by a, a, an individual, um, and they're the primary purchaser of the policy. Um, and then from that standpoint, you have. Uh, you know, an individual actually goes out and purchases purchases the initial policy. Um, Steve, I don't know if you're, you're back. I, I want to pick yeah, up. Yeah, sorry, I I had a glitch. I'm, I'm, my apologies. No worries, uh, buddy. Jump back so, in. So yeah, so 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 essentially, uh, what what occurs is um, a person who owns a policy decides that they no longer need that policy for whatever reason. It maybe that's very expensive or so on, and. Uh, they essentially sell the death benefit that's on them to a third party, and then the third party assumes the obligation of paying the premiums uh, for the life of the contract. Now, most of these policies, or the policies that tend to work best, are policies that are universal life policies. Uh, but any type of policy, whether it's whole life or term, can be settled. Um, so that's essentially very simply what it is. It's the transfer of the risk um, from one party to another. Now, that's essentially occurs in what we call the secondary market for life insurance or the primary market for life settlements there. And we'll talk about this later. There's also a tertiary market where uh, investors will trade these policies uh, amongst one another. Uh, but that's that's essentially uh, the basics uh, to um, to the transaction. As you can see in this particular uh, depiction, um, the policy owner will sell the policy to the buyer. The buyer will give a cash value for that policy. And then the new, the buyer will then uh, pay the premiums to the life insurance company and the life insurance company upon the death of the original seller will pay the buyer. So think of it this way. Think of it as essentially um, a, a life settlement is essentially a zero coupon bond without any true stated maturity. Um, now we get into the life expectancy of people, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and the maturity actually is um, 
probabilistic based on these different life expectancies. But essentially, you're creating these zero coupon bonds. You can create portfolios out of this. And um, it has become a very, very interesting asset class with a fairly um, a fairly predictable revenue stream to it. You can go on to the next slide. Yeah, let's go back and uh, take us back to the beginning with the kind of the, the legal foundation of life settlements and where that kind of came from. Yeah, so I mean, really, it goes, um, and I'll talk. I can talk briefly about the history of it here. But the first insurance policy that was sold or settled was uh, was a policy that was sold by an individual back in nineteen, uh, I think uh, nineteen eleven, uh, and uh, a person wanted medical. Uh, person was very sick, and they wanted uh, medical work to be done, and um, they essentially sold their policy to one of their doctors as payment for medical services. Now, when that person eventually um, passed on, the doctor tried to collect the death benefit and the insurance companies basically said, no, you can't do that. You can't sell a policy. Uh, well, the result of, of this dispute ended up at the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court basically said in this ruling Gr Grigsby versus Russell in 1911 that uh, an insurance policy is a form of real property and you can sell it and you can convey it and you can receive consideration for that conveyance. Uh, that set the stage in law for um, insurance policies to be transferred as a form of property. Nothing really happened in, in the life settlement market for a very long period of time. Um, in the 80s, um, the market began to surface uh, and eventually would turn into a fairly substantial niche market. But many of you may remember that during the AIDS crisis, uh, there were a lot of folks who were terminally ill and many of them had insurance policies. And in order to either finance uh, their medical treatment or just generate liquidity, uh, a small but burgeoning market began to develop in uh, what was called then viatical settlements. And those were essentially sales by insurance to third parties who would purchase uh, for net you know, cash value or net present value um, the life insurance policy and um, you know, essentially provide liquidity to, to a lot of people who were suffering. Uh, so the mar so from the very beginning, there was an economic incentive to do this market and to build upon it. And at the same time, there was, uh, uh, we could talk about it later, but there was essentially a social aspect to it. Um, that market began to grow in the 80s as we moved into the 90s, as people started to realize, well, not only could you do this with people who were very ill and had a very short life expectancy, but there were a lot of older seniors who were fairly well-to-do, um, who were essentially overinsured. And um, there was a potential market for seniors to sell their larger death benefit policies uh, out into a marketplace. Um, and uh, the smart Wall Street investment bankers realized soon enough that there was particular opportunity there. And uh, as we went into the late 90s and into the beginning of the 2000s, uh, a whole secondary market in life insurance uh, began to grow. And you could see by this, uh, this chart, um, right around 2005, there was about 5 billion in what we call face value or aggregate death benefit that was transacted in the market. Um, and, uh, the investment banks jump, jumped right in and in their uh, very creative ways would create derivative products around these uh, underlying assets and so on in order to open them up. Well, what really happened is, is a lot of players recognized the economic opportunity in the mid 2000s. And as uh, funds started to move in and buy uh, these uh, secondary uh, um, policies, and as they started to construct portfolios of uh, diversified life insurance policies, um, a tertiary market began. Uh, tertiary, mar tertiary market really could not begin until there was substantial 
uh, assets out in the secondary market. But as you can see, the tertiary market has grown uh, from 2008 and has gotten to be a larger and larger uh, part of this market. Um, and essentially, the secondary market continues to be the original supply. And then people buy these policies as we do at Air Asset Management. And then we essentially um, rebalance our portfolios, increase our portfolios, decrease our portfolios by selling policies that we have in our portfolios to other players who are interested. Um, you know, just talk a little bit, of, you know, we talked a little bit about this just a few seconds ago, about the timeline of, of life settlements. Um, it's it's interest, interesting to see how this market um, has expanded. Um, we, to this very day, would not be able to, you know, speak as we do about the um, the success of this marketplace without having that very important expansion of the secondary market uh, up until the early 2000s. You know, as I, men as I mentioned, major investment banks were very involved with expanding into the tertiary market. Um, right around, right after 2008 and the credit crisis of 2008, um, the market, the life settlement market itself and life insurance policies offered some uh, advantage to new players coming in um, because of the because of some of the fall off in liquidity in general during that liquidity crisis, um, the price of a lot of life settlements dropped relative to where they had been several years before, like around 2007. Um, this allowed uh, sophisticated people and institutional investors to come into the space. And that has ended up being a, a very, very positive element uh, because this market's expanded to uh, today where not only do you have institutional type and style fund managers such as ourselves uh, coming in, but you have even larger institutional players in the space who uh, essentially uh, invest in life insurance contracts or life settlements as a way of diversifying aspects of their portfolio. Um, and uh, at this very point in time, it's safe to say that uh, life settlements in force which would be essentially all of the life insurance policies that are probably held um, by portfolio managers and funds and institutional players. Um, and this is an anecdotal amount that I'll throw out, but um, uh, probably approaches uh, somewhere between 125 and 150 billion. So the market has grown. And uh, as a function of that, um, there is, uh, for a level three asset of which this is, uh, a fair amount of transacting going on and, and uh, underlying liquidity uh, in the marketplace. Steve, who are some of the major players that you've seen enter the space from an institutional standpoint? Well, you know, um, Berkshire Hathaway is, is huge in it. Uh, AIG, uh, KKR, Fortress, um, are very large players on the endowment side. We we know that University of Michigan has a very sizable portfolio in it. Um, there are other universities. We actually have a client that's a university or an investor that's a university um, endowment that invests with us. Um, so you know those are those are just some of the names. Um, there are still the the investment banks have gotten out of this market a bit, um, but there are still fairly large legacy portfolios that exist with Credit Suisse and and Deutsche Bank. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's some major, major players in this, not to mention, you know, private equity firms that are that are beginning to come in. Uh, and we see interest all the time um, from from these types of folks who, you know, not only want to necessarily invest, but also uh, want to be participant um, as, uh, you know, investors in this space directly, as opposed to maybe through a fund. You know, just um, as my background, uh Back in 2014, I was I obviously knew Rich very well back in the day. We were friends uh, since 2008. Uh, he approached me with this fund and in, in, in this sector um, in 2014, and I found it fascinating. I looked at you know some of the attributes that you have within this sector. Um, you know, obviously, you've kind of led an insurance company and sold a lot of insurance over the years. Um, but I really didn't understand the benefits of actually buying and selling policies. And I got to tell you, to this day, most RIAs, and a lot of uh, financial advisors, the majority of the ones we talk to don't even realize that 
their clients can even sell the policy. You start seeing some of the commercials, um, it's becoming a little bit more direct consumer based in terms of sourcing of policies. Um, yeah. But you really don't, you know, I didn't even understand the space. And I found it fascinating. Um, you know, some of the, the key things that you look at, and we'll talk about this in our kind of why and what some of the benefits of, of life settlements. But what we found is that there really is little to no correlate, you know, correlation um, and inc incredibly low volatility. Obviously, last year was a, a really solid year for us being up 13 and a half percent. And we'll kind of get in how this is performed against you know, the S&P. But it really just you know, showed that there really is little to no correlation between life insurance um, and the markets. And it definitely has pretty low volatility. It's a pretty stable investment. Um, you know, I, I like the fact that on one side of the trade, you, you have insurance companies, which are very strong, you know, strong balance sheet transactions. Um, so, and it's obviously there's a regulatory structure to insurance policies as well. Um, and it, it is touches on social responsibility. We'll talk about that in a way a little bit too, because it does bring liquidity to seniors that may need that. Even back in the day when Steve talked about the first one that was originally, um, was medical based where the person could couldn't afford the medical bills and they sought after this as a, as a sense of liquidity. Um, you know, many, many seniors now are, are looking at the same thing. So we'll kind of talk about that today, but, you know, overall, you know, there's a lot of really interesting attributes when you're considering, if you're looking for non-correlated low volatility type investment to complement your portfolio, um, this certainly has those attributes, you know, obviously as Steve mentioned that, you know, the primary var variable, the value of life settlement parallel policy when we're buying these policies is to make sure that obviously the policies that we purchase, we buy it at the right price because we do have premiums. There's an outflow of capital um, to maintain these premiums until the person matures. So we, there's a process um, on how we actually price policies and how we manage policies and how we kind of mitigate that risk. Um, you know, in certain, in certain funds, we're able to trade and buy and sell. We don't wait to the policies hold. Uh, or mature, we can actually have the ability to create some alpha in terms of um, being able to buy and selling policies uh, while we're there within our, within our portfolio. Um, but, you know, even on, on one, one thing comes up sometimes is during COVID, you know, how did COVID affect it? Did, did mortalities increase? And actually it was the opposite. Actually mortalities flattened a little bit because we realized that a lot of people stayed at home and they weren't going out and, um, they're, they're a little bit more cautious about what they were doing, um, which, you know, brought down, we, we felt it was actually the, the mortality actually during those times was lower than it is now. Um, so, you know, it wasn't necessarily, hey, you know, because of COVID, it jumped. We found actually the, quite the opposite that actually more stabilized or actually went down a little bit. Um, so, you know, diversifying into an asset class like this, that's, you know, has low correlation, low vol. Um, it, you know, for certain people, it, it, it's a nice fit for a portfolio. Uh, Steve, I'm not sure if there's anything you want to kind of add to that. Yeah, no, a, a couple of things. I, I think, um, you know, it's important to understand that um, for what we, what we often talk about is we talk about risk and reward. And what I want to draw people's attention to is the relationship between risk and reward in this market. So for instance, if you look at the performance of the asset class, if you look at, but particularly air asset management's performance, what you see is, you know, consistent returns with um, very low volatility. And that's important because when you look at the relationship of the returns and low volatility, we call it sharp ratio, uh, it, Using that ratio basically is the only way you really can compare investments across multiple asset classes. So, you know, when you look at life settlements or when you look at um, the S&P or when you look at fixed income, how can you compare? Well, one of the ways to do it is to essentially use a sharp ratio or look at the relationship of return and volatility. Uh, and here, um, the asset class generally does fairly well but you know we we've really outperformed we have sharp ratios that are you know above five and six which basically tells you that we have consistent returns in our portfolios with very very little volatility um if you look here how did we you know perform um during certain periods of angst and uh, downward markets 
um, you could see that uh, there's basically an inverse correlation to um, to negative markets uh, displayed by the S and P. You know, at least going back to October of eighteen, which when we have some of our data, we've collected our data. Um, but you know, it's also to mention in here, and we may have a slide on this, but uh, we run uh, we run uh, a correlation to the S and P of about 0.2. So we're very very uh, uncorrelated, uh, and that's important because you know not only are you generating sort of equity like returns, let's say in the low teens, but you're doing it with private credit, and yeah, you're doing it with 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 low risk fixed income type of volatility. Uh, another way we describe this is, you know, through what we call this efficient frontier, where you can look at uh, on the vertical axis, essentially potential return, and then look at volatility or risk. Um, and it, you know, it's intuitive that the higher the risk, the higher the return uh, of certain asset classes. And in this particular case, you can actually draw what we call the sufficient frontier. If you look at the risk and reward of different assets, such as treasury bills, government bonds, domestic stocks, and so on. And you can see any asset that is to the left and above that particular line exceeds uh, what we call the essentially the efficient frontier. And Life Settlements does this. And getting back to what Bobby was saying before, this is why this asset class is so fascinating. Um, you know, when properly managed. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I, I just, I want to make sure people really focus on risk, reward, and why this asset class and why our particular funds um, have done well and have performed very, very well uh, with respect to other asset classes. You know, now the, the other part of this is supply side. Yeah. You know, so when you look at, you know, okay, it's a great asset class. It has a proven track record. Um, we have a proven track record. Um, you know, well, how about the supply side to policies? And when you look at the market trends right now on the supply side on insurance, it's pretty incredible. If you actually look at um, on the left-hand side, you'll see that one incredible stat that the aging population is 10,000 people. They're going to turn 65 every day for the next 15 years. And, you know, you look at the majority of these individuals don't have the retirement savings necessary. You have inflation going up dramatically, obviously. Interest rates and short-term um, interest for credit cards and things like that are going up. Healthcare costs are going up. So you have a, an aging baby boomer demographic that's, you know, that we've never really seen before. So, and you have a lot of these policies right now, that the, the market of, face value from 2021 that projected 2030 is over 233 billion um, of you know the, the life settlement market, which is massive and over 20 trillion of face, face amount. So just to give that a perspective of how big that market actually is, if you take the entire residential market for, for real estate, um, that's 13 trillion. So you have a 20 trillion market of policies face that benefit now not all those policies are going to you know fit the sweet spot of a policy that we're going to want to acquire you know with these attributes that we're looking for a certain age a certain type of policy as steve mentioned we look at term or convertible you know or uls convertible ul the uh, term to ul universal life um but you look at the market it's a it's a it's an exploding market and you look at the current economic conditions the environment and the demand and the need for liquidity um, you know, is it, really just putting a lot of blood, lifeblood into this bit, this business. And, you know, for us to be able to, you know, we, we have, we have a lot of confidence in terms of where the market's going. And it, it talks to capacity as well. It, yeah. it talks to capacity as well. Yeah. And to pick up on that point, you know, I mean, obviously you have 20 trillion in life insurance policies in force, you know, a fraction of those may, uh, you know, go to a life settlement, you know, but even if you were to say, you know, 5% over a period of time, you're still talking about 1 billion in face value, um, which means that the capacity of the market is set up for more players to come in and to become not only niche where it is, okay, uh, but to become almost moderately mainstream. 
And it's just a matter of education and more and more people becoming participants. And as Bobby alluded to earlier, you have uh, commercials now, Coventry Direct. Coventry is one of the largest intermediaries in the marketplace um, that is now going on TV and talking about, you know, how to settle a life insurance policy. Um, so these are all, you know, very, very important aspects to the supply side, as Bobby wanted to emphasize, because it speaks to capacity and growth. The fact is, is that there's so much interest in this market that, you know, the way in which supply hits the market, demand is there. And what we've seen over the last 10 years with this, you know, fairly robust growth in this market is that there's been plenty of demand to essentially sop up all that supply. This market is, has really from a, uh, a an interest or a return point of view, an IRR, what we call it, okay, has, has stayed um, stable over the last four to five years because of that um, equilibrium between uh, supply and demand. You know, it is it is truly educational. It's a good point. I mean, I, I talk to a lot of my friends that are RAAs and insurance agents. One of the guys I work with and very good friends with, um, he's a large master general agent for a very large company. Um, mm -hmm. He has a bunch of agents underneath him, over 250,000 policies, and he hasn't done any life settlements that we just brought him into the space. So mm -hmm. there you have someone that's been in life insurance. They have over 250,000 policies kind of in their network. And they haven't done any life settlements. You have a lot of RIAs that don't understand that there's an asset there. And what's amazing that I find is that one of the most valuable assets people have is their policy. Now, you know, there's going to be a need for if there's no need for the policy, you're you know you're married, and your your spouse passed away, or there's a second to die, or a key man, or buy sell. Um, over, we see some statistics where over ninety percent of policies lapse, where the people didn't even realize they could actually there's a secondary market to potentially sell these. So there's still a big educational learning curve um, with the numbers that you're seeing on the screen right now. Um, and our job is to really try to get out there and let the, you know, the professionals and the individuals know that there are options on their policies um, and you know, kind of the, the process on how to do it. So certainly a very big market um, and a lot, a lot of capacity. Yeah, and a lot of people, I'm sorry, Bobby, just to jump on, but to support that point that you were saying, you know, and a lot of people are overinsured. So what happens is, is as people get older, they have one policy and then they acquire another one and another one. You know, a lot of business owners will have multiple policies and they get into their 80s and they start to say, look, I don't need all this. My kids are set. Uh, family's pretty well set, you know, through my estate planning over time. And, you know, why am I carrying four different policies with an aggregate, you know, death benefit of 10 or $15 million? And that's become a real impetus for people to sell off their policy. So part of the education that you're talking about really is, you know, it's geared to, to, to that audience, um, you know, as well as to the direct to consumer, which, you know, we, we can talk about. Well, I mean, even the term insurance, your term insurance, the term insurance. Going, going up at large, yeah. you had no idea that you can actually sell a policy. Yeah. You just let it lapse. So, um, yeah, I think there's obviously a, a, a yeah. big need for it. And we do consider this a socially responsible investment. Um, you know, people need liquidity. They, they're expensive, as we talked about earlier, that their, their expenses are going up, the cost of living is going up. Um, they're looking for liquidity. And mm -hmm. this brings that liquidity. If they don't need the death benefit, um, this brings some some liquidity to help them with long term care or some of the other costs that are that are they're, they're facing in their in their life and based in the economy today. So, um, see, let's kind of switch gears to risks. So let's talk yeah, about sure. key risks to consider when you're considering life settlements. Essentially, you know, the key risk here is longevity risk and being able to, you know, we've got to, as fund managers, we've got to be able to understand what the life expectancies are of individual insureds, and then at a portfolio level, what are those life expectancies? Because if you think about it, um, if folks uh, pass away uh, faster than expected, um, as investors in those insurance policies, we will uh, generate excess uh, return. Um, but the converse of that is well, what happens if people start to live longer and longer? Or what happens if you're underestimating your uh, longevity in your portfolio? Well, then you're subject to the what we call extension risk. In other words, basically, as people live longer than expected, the cost for keeping that insurance in place goes up 
because you have to pay more premiums relative to a fixed death benefit. Um, and uh, if your portfolio is subject to extensive extension risk, uh, then the value of that portfolio will, will be negatively affected. So, you know, our job really as portfolio managers and portfolio construction is to have an understanding of the individual and aggregate uh, longevity risk that's uh, present in our portfolios and to be able to manage that risk. And, you know, happy to talk to you folks individually or, you know, uh, sub subsequently to this uh, particular webinar about how we do and go into some of the details about how we do manage that risk. Um, but nonetheless, that's that's something that really is a predominant risk uh, that we face. Uh, the other is there is liquidity risk, you know, which is, um, and it occurs at two different levels. One is um, the underlying assets, life settlements themselves uh, are not, government bonds. So you're not going to go to a Bloomberg terminal and bring up a price. Now, we may at some point um, in the medium term be able to move in that direction of standardization, but that's a whole different argument. But there is natural, they are level three assets, so they there is some natural illiquidity to the asset class. Um, and uh, there's also risk at the fund level uh, in the event that you um, might have uh, very large redemptions and so on, uh, you would have to manage that risk. Uh, now, we have mechanisms in place to do both. Uh, the key risk for us is not so much the market illiquidity of the asset, but fund level liquidity. Uh, and the ways in which we manage that are uh, primarily through our fund documents and the notice periods that we have and so on. Uh, in addition to that, we, uh, on a weekly basis, have internal liquidity meetings between our portfolio management group and our finance group. Uh, and in doing so, we go through all our liquidity, uh, demands on our liquidity, inflows and outflows of cash, how they're going to be allocated, and so on. So we're, we're very, very uh, cognizant of uh, any types of impacts that might be negative from a liquidity point of view. But it is, it is a risk and something to can consider. I would say the next level is valuation risk. Um, you know, these are level three assets. What is the valuation process and policy that a fund manager uses to value these? Um, essentially, and I'll just take 30 seconds, the valuation, uh, basically speaking, of a life insurance policy is the net present value of the death benefit that's distributed over time. Uh, versus the present value of the premiums that you pay. So uh, when you look at a death benefit, that's a positive source of cash. Uh, when you look at the premiums you pay, that's that's an outflow of cash. And you essentially discount those streams uh, over time. Uh, and that time is determined by someone's life expectancy. Um, the discount rate that you use to determine that net present value of the policy uh, is really the IRR that you as an investor would expect in order to generate return. And you can imagine if there are a lot of players in the market, those discount rates are fairly similar. Um, now, every month in an open-ended vehicle like our flagship fund, uh, you we value those policies and we have to have a, a discount rate by which we value those policies every month. And um, there's what we do is we use numerous sources to determine what that valuation number is. But it is something that if you're looking in the space that you wanna make sure you understand and that you wanna make sure that the player or the fund or the, the, the asset manager in the space has a very, very um, defined process for valuing uh, its assets, number one. And number two, not only is it a defined process, but it's a best practice and it's also relevant and applicable. I would say the final risk in this space is the fact that, you know, you are, you are assuming counterparty risk when you buy an insurance policy. Um, you know, the counterparty risk eventually is the carrier uh, and that the carrier will deliver and pay under a, a, what we call a maturity, which is a death benefit a claim that we would file in the event someone passes. Um, we tend to find this to be a very minimal risk. Um, essentially, every just about every valid 
and legitimate life insurance policy that's ever been written has been paid by a carrier. Um, but nonetheless, we do look at credit ratings of carriers. We do look at our concentration. We make sure that we're not over concentrated with certain carriers. And we do that as a, as a best practice from a portfolio management point of view to, to sort of limit our concentration, uh, our essential credit risk uh, with, with our carriers. You know, one thing I think that is key is just the overall strategy of being quantitative versus qualitative. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's important. There, there, are, there are portfolios out there that are more qualitative versus quantitative. Um, you know, so can you just talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's, you know, been, been the key to some of the success that we've had. Yeah, yeah. But people have different approaches. And what Bobby means by, by qualitative is there are, there are investors and funds who tend not to look at actuarial representations of life expectancy as much as they tend to be clinical. In other words, they may have uh, a number of doctors as advisors to their fund. And what they'll do is they'll tend to invest and purchase policies based on what kind of impairment uh, the insureds have. So we do see from time to time, you know, players out there who say, well, I, I, I'd like to increase my multiple myeloma exposure, or I'd like to increase my cardiac exposure or my diabetes exposure or a combination of those things. Um, and they essentially look for certain types of impairments in the underlying insurance. And that process really involves um, getting very deep into the insurance medical records. And then of course, having medical professionals um, reviewing those records and coming up with a life expectancy based on uh, experience and uh, assessment. Um, we do it differently. We like to say we don't play doctor, but what we do is we rely on third party companies that specialize in underwriting life expectancy based on the impairments and large amounts of data. So therefore, we rely on large amounts of data uh, to provide uh, a very uh, representative sample of what longevity or what, uh, what uh, essentially longevity may be for particular insureds. So when we go into the market, we don't rely on the impairment so much as we look at the life expectancy. And what we do is we construct portfolios with... Um, a diverse group of life expectancies. Some people may have very short life expectancies, others may have very long ones. And what we do is we try to sort of blend the portfolio based on this sort of very quantitative and actuarial approach. And I think that's a key. You know, we're not yeah. chasing specific things. You know, yeah. I, I think it's more, it's a more prudent approach to diversify because you never know when someone's going to mature. It doesn't matter what their health or health conditions are. It, it does to a degree. But if you're just so far on that side, you try to chase that down the rabbit hole, sometimes those policies could be more expensive to purchase. And, you know, on the other side, if you're looking at more of just the um, quantitative, we're looking at more of a broad, you know, mix of policies because you just don't know what's going to happen. And obviously we have a significant amount of policies that we, we own um, and, you know, and that will mature throughout the year. And it's just, it's just, it's a numbers game at the end of the day. Um, but you got to do, you got to enter the space the right way. And Steve's obviously got tremendous experience in this. Um, like I said, I, I saw, I invested this back in 2014. Um, and it's been, you know, a, a very, right. very positive, very solid investment to balance out some of the volatility that's happening and, you know, something to consider. So, you know, obviously to today we want to just give you that high level overview, kind of get down into um, some of the weeds, but uh, certainly we have a lot of good materials. If you go to our website, um, airassetmanager.com. Um, we've really invested a tremendous amount of time and, and energy to put together great materials where you could actually go on there. We have a lot of videos. Um, we have a lot of tear sheets. Um, certainly, we're more than happy to sit down and, and talk to you individually. If this is something you're considering, um, we'd love to talk to you as well. So maybe I can open this up for some Q&A now. And uh, we got some plenty of time left of the clock here to, to answer some of your questions. Ryan, we can't hear you. Yeah, Ryan, we can't hear you. I'm not sure if you're muted. <laughs> Ryan.
It doesn't show muted, but for some reason, your, 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 your audio is not coming through. <laughs> How about now? There you yep. go. There you go. All right. Uh, well, that was fun. Uh, so, yeah, so no Q&A in there just yet. Uh, Taylor, thank you for putting the information. So if you do have interest in reaching out to the team, uh, Taylor put in the chat. Uh, so Air Asset Management at the website, airassetmanagement.com or info at airassetmanagement.com is going to be the best email and the website. Thanks, guys, for pointing that out. Um, okay, Kevin has a question here. Mm -hmm. The uh, investment minimum and fund structure or waterfall, if you guys can kind of address that broadly for, for Kevin. Sure. Yeah, let me let me take it. Um, we, we just finished uh, updating our PPMs. Let me give you the, the fund structure first, and then we can talk about uh, some minimums. So we run uh, our own feeder funds into our own sub funds, okay? So we have Air US Life Fund 2, QP, which is for our qualified purchasers. And then we have Air US Life Fund 2, which is for our qualified clients. And then we have two offshore vehicles. And investors will invest in those funds. And then what we do is we allocate to specific sub funds that, that are proprietary. And they can contain the different assets. So for instance, we will we will uh, once money comes in through or subscriptions come in through Air US Life Fund 2 at the top level, so the umbrella funds, um, we then allocate to uh, you know our large face value portfolio, our diverse face uh, uh, portfolio. We also have a portfolio which um, has both life settlements and life contingent annuities in it. Uh, and then we also have a private credit aspect to um, the Air US Life Fund 2 strategy, which is why it's a diversified strategy. Here we're talking predominantly about life settlements, but we, we do have other assets within um, the strategy that help to diversify um, the return profile of life settlements. It just happens to be that uh, roughly 80 to 84% of our assets are in life settlements. Um, so that's basically the fund structure. You come in through Area Life Fund 2, and then as portfolio managers, we allocate to our sub funds. Um, and uh, we do this for a number of reasons, for liquidity. We also can ring fence a portfolio if it runs into some issues and not affect the rest of Area Life Fund 2. So there's a, there's a risk management uh, aspect to that. Um, in terms of uh, share classes, we have institutional share class. We have... Uh, and then we have uh, um, 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 an intermediate share class and then a retail share class. So the minimum investment is essentially $250,000. Um, there's a two-year lock on that. There's a 180-day notice. Um, and the, 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 the fees there are, are, uh, are uh, uh, 175 and 20% uh, performance fee with a 6% hard hurdle. So we don't even collect performance fees until we generate a better than 6% uh, annualized return. And then we have an institutional class, which is one and a quarter. Um, and, uh, uh, and then we have another class, which is a shorter duration uh, with, uh, with a, a 175 as well. But, you know, getting back to the fund structure and the investor share classes, um, we definitely can, you know, Kevin put you in touch with uh, uh uh, Andrea Hoke, who's our uh, managing director, uh, I'm sorry, our director of uh, investor relations. Okay, great. Thanks, Steve. Uh, next question. If you look at your first fund that you put together, how many policies were in that fund and how many policies have matured? Uh, also, how many policies did you originally project to have matured? So a couple part question there. You can kind of piece them together as, as you see fit. So. Okay, so let me take the first part. If you look at the first fund you put together, how many policies were in that fund 
and how many policies have matured. So you, starting from August, starting from really the summer of 2018, we started to purchase policies. Um, we started with one <laughs> and we've built now, <laughs> we've built now to, we're just over 725 policies uh, across the board uh, in terms of what we manage. Um, um, how many have matured? Okay. Um, we, uh, a fair amount. Um, we, um, we do have a particular strategy, which we'd love to just go into detail with, with any one of you, but we will need an NDA sign and, you know, have to be a little further along the way. Um, but we have, uh, we do chart our actual to expected ratio, which is the actual number of maturities versus what we expect. Um, we really began charting that back in 2021. Um, what you want to do is have something that is the ratio that's close to one as possible. In other words, if you expect, you know, 50 maturities in a year, you know, what did you actually get? You know, or let's just, you know, if you got 40, you know, you're going to be four fifths of that, you know, roughly 80%, which is not bad, actually, because remember, this is highly probabilistic world. Um, and then if you, if you expect 100 deaths or maturities and you get 110, you've exceeded your expectations. Um, you know, you be, I mean, you, you, you may think that's actually fantastic, but you really do want to get it as close as you can to what you expected, you know. Um, so we started looking at that. We don't place a lot of emphasis on that ratio ratio because we're an open-ended fund. Um, and we are constantly selling. So if you imagine if we if we place a lot of emphasis on that and then we're selling a lot of policies, policies are going out the door and then they're being replaced by new policies, which you want to hold on to for a period of time and season. Um, so that ratio doesn't really kind of make sense for an open-ended fund. If you have a closed-end vehicle, it, it makes more sense because the portfolio runs off over time. Uh, but we, we do look at it and um, we've been very fortunate. We have a particular strategy that has worked. And we, as of last time I checked, um, our actual maturities were across the board uh, in excess of what we expected going back a year ago. Um, but that, you know, that can change. And there is seasonality. That's another thing. There is seasonality in the life settlement market. You know, people tend not to pass away in the beautiful weather and climates of summer. Um, and there's a seasonality to it that begins in October and usually ends around, it's strange to think of it, but ends right around now. Um, so uh, yeah, so, you know, how many have, have matured? Um, you know, I, I could talk a little bit about our attribution, uh, you know, which is between realized and unrealized gains in the funds. Uh, our realized gains, which would of course include matured policies, runs about 50%, which is actually quite good for a open-ended growing uh, life settlement hedge fund. Um, and I think I answered the last part of that. Uh, yeah. Question. Yeah. Um, I'll open it up. We've got a, a couple of minutes left, so I'll open it up for any other Q and A. Um, and kind of tagging on to David's question, how how often do you guys refine your underwriting model uh, based on on what has happened? You know, if you, from when you started buying policies to now, how often do you refine that underwriting model based on on actual results in the fund? So, um, so I think what you're saying is, how often do we sort of revalue the life insurance policies in the fund? Yeah, you know, I guess based, as, based as you're sourcing new policies. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or are you asking a question geared towards sourcing? I just want to. Yeah, kind of to David's question about how you've performed to your expectations. Do you go back and then revise your underwriting for sourcing new deals based on on the performance of the fund and and what you've seen versus your oh, original see. underwriting expectations? I see. Yeah, you're always looking at that. I mean, it's all it's really important to do that. I mean, that's part of the portfolio management process. Yeah. It's like. You know, and then as your portfolio gets bigger and bigger, you have more diversification in it and it raises new challenges and it raises new opportunities. So, you know, 
our main sort of approach to underwriting, you know, the approach and the process is consistent over time. But we look, we go back and we look at, you know, like certain things we did two years ago, three years ago, we, we're doing a little differently now. So let me just give you an example. Okay. So, you know, let's say we have a lot of maturities and it's a lot of people who are, you know, 89 to 94. Okay. What do we want to do? Do we want to replace those policies or do we want to, you know, roll out of those and maybe move into younger people? Because the older people that have a higher probability of death are more expensive policies. Um, whereas the younger people are not as expensive for us, you know, so how do we want to carry the assets? Um, you know, so these are, you know, that's a basic question, but those are the kind of things that we look at. So we're always looking at, you know, how we underwrite, how we rebalance and where we want the risks to lie in the portfolio. Yeah, great, great. Um, there has a couple follow-up questions. Uh, you'll probably read along with me, but uh, so he's saying, maybe I don't understand how the fund is constructed. And I invested in a different life settlement fund in 2017. That fund purchased 723 policies in total, 239 matured as of January 1st of this year. Originally, they had predicted 310. It would have matured by now. So they're they're behind quite a bit. Of course, ultimately, all of them will mature uh, and we'll, we'll get the, the DV back as long as the fund maintains uh, liquidity. And, and he tagged along this question. So it's an open-ended fund. So I guess that makes it a little impossible to, to answer the question, but uh, to the best you can for how, how he's posed it. And, and why yeah, are it's we... A, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, as an open-ended fund, it's really difficult to answer that question. I, David, contact us. I'll follow up with you. Um, and I can give you specifics and I can give you metrics around that rather than sort of, I don't have them at my fingertips right now. And then talk a little bit about you know, what you're identifying in the first part of this question, which is they told me a certain amount would mature and less than that has occurred. And what is the meaning of that? So I would, David, I would definitely um, encourage you to, to reach out to us so we can have a, you know, fruitful conversation about that rather than do it here. And, and uh, thanks, David. Uh, so Steve, to your to your earlier point about about the fund maintaining roughly eighty percent of that is is life settlements, and then you've got other uh, other assets within your portfolio to to mitigate risk and maintain liquidity too. So that probably, as well as the fact that you guys are buying and selling policies throughout, it's not a static fund that purchases a set number of policies, and and that's the only fund the only policies that fund will ever own. So that that's a different dynamic than probably the, the other fund that he's in, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, it's a different dynamic. That's our strategy at a sort of global level for Arios Life Fund 2. We want it to be multi-strat. Um, there is a lumpiness to some extent to, you know, to, to returns on pure life settlement plays. Um, and uh, it's not until you get fairly diversified that you have, you know, uh, a smoothing of the lumpiness uh, based on the different types of return, whether it be sales, maturities, unrealized gain, you know, and so on. But what we found is, is by going into select and opportunistic allocations within private credit, credit um, we've been able to generate a very, you know, interest income, basically. And, you know, what that does is it creates a predictability and a reliability to the fund's uh, revenue stream that helps to complement um, the revenue stream that's really tied to um, to the life settlement market. Now, we also have allocations to life contingent annuities, and those annuities are actually the opposite of life settlements. They're a positive carry asset. You know, you want the people to live a long time. Uh, because they're, you know, they've sold an annuity to you and you're receiving monthly cash flows. Um, and to that extent, um, you know, the valuation in those assets is very helpful because it tends to offset the, the valuation component to the life settlements. So we look at, you know, the, 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 the mathematics of it, you know, the arithmetic, um, the underlying risks, the, you know, credit risk and so on and bring it together and, and, you know, there have been times where we've been a little low on the life settlement monthly income. And, you know, thank goodness we have this, you know, roughly 10% allocation of private credit. Um, so you see it being fruitful, it comes through, shows itself. 
One thing, Steve, actually, you brought up a great point that we didn't really discuss earlier is that this is a multi-strat. So, well, they, well I guess we're talking about a few things there, closed-end fund versus open-end fund, and we can mm -hmm. certainly talk to you one-on-one -on -one about the differences of the two. Obviously, the open-end fund is a little bit more complex because we're buying and selling and trading policies. We're not just waiting for maturity. Um, so there's a little bit more active management within that. But the one unique thing that um, about this fund, the way we have it set up, is this: it's the, the, the flagship fund is not just a life settlement fund. It's actually a multi-strat fund. So it is involved in other things like private credit, um, structured settlements, and also uh, legal finance, which is another area that we're um, uh, getting into as well. Um, we've had a lot of success with. So, the you know, pr predominantly it is a, a life settlement fund. But what's really nice about this fund that and the, the flagship fund we created is that it's an open end structure. Um, it is multi strat, so we are diversified in other areas other than just. Um, life settlements, because obviously life settlements, as Steve mentioned, is a, a premium going out. So it's an outflow of capital. But if we're buying structured settlements like an annuity, that's cash flow coming in every single month. So, um, you know, which I, which I really, it, 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 you know, one of the reasons why I invested into is I really like the fact that it was just diversified. If you want to just really get specifically into life settlements, you can do that. But if you want to have more of a multi-strat, you can do that. If you want to have a closed end or open end structure, we have that as well. So we have multiple options, kind of depends upon what your appetite is. And if you're an international investor versus domestic investor, we have those options as well. So, but it is important to, you know, that, to mention that we, we got this, this, the flagship fund is a multi-strat fund. Um, and it's not hundred percent in life settlements. Yeah. And, and I get what Bobby's saying too. I want to, Play on, I want to add to you. So we, we, we have these sub funds, which, which we run and we, we set that up, as I said earlier, you know, contain if there's particular risk in one fund, but um, we, we do, people can invest directly into our sub funds. So, you know, there are people who want a pure life settlement plan, like we're speaking of, you know, fairly large investor right now, that's not as interested in the private credit. Um, and they can come into three or four different choices, um, you know, uh, sub to our uh you know own feeder structure you know we like to talk about air us life fund too because we think the diversified approach makes a lot of sense um and the multi-strat is the best way to to sort of you know generate return but there are some people who really do want a pure play uh, we've got other people who are very into we have air legal finance fund which is really a fund that does law firm lending as distinct from litigation finance okay but we can talk to any of you uh, you know, subsequently on this. Uh, but uh, we have people that are very interested in the legal, in lending to, you know, to law firms and, you know, the quality of the collateral and the revenue streams that are coming in there because that's niche as well. Uh, so there are a number of things that we could do even to the individual investor. Great, great. Well, thanks guys. I think uh, that, that was the end of our, our Q&A and we're, we're up at the hour, but uh, very much appreciate you guys coming on today and discussing this. I know that there are several that that uh, that this is brand new, a brand new asset class for. So very interesting and especially given the times right now too. So yep. um, I know that again, pointing out Taylor has uh, put the comments in the chat, but if, for those of you that are watching the recording, uh, website is airassetmanagement.com and the email is info at airassetmanagement.com if you want to reach out to the team. Uh, any any closing remarks, Bobby or Steve? No, we'd like so we, we uh, we're very yeah. open to answer whatever questions that you have um, and we can follow up with you. Um, but like I said, it's, it, is, it, it is an educational process. If, you, if you're new to the space, certainly have a lot of questions. Um, we have a complete data room. Obviously, we you know have NDAs in place for that, but we have a complete data room um, and we'd be more than happy to talk to you or your advisor if you have one. Perfect. Yeah, and, yeah, and thank you, uh, Ryan, and and thanks everyone for the opportunity to talk here. We we do appreciate it. And uh, to back up what, Rob, what Bobby just said is, you know, we're good at follow up. So, and we spend a lot of time with prospects. So please, you know, inquire, uh, we'll spend time. Absolutely, Ready? Ryan. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Appreciate yeah, the you bet, Steve. You bet, Bobby. Okay. Have a good one. Thanks, everyone. All right, everyone. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you.